and we are live. Okay. Great. Thank you everyone for coming to Brisbane Power Shell Meetup Group. Um, we have a great night planned. We have Michael doing news and doing. Are you doing modules of the month, Michael? Um, yeah, modules of the month, but it's going to be a quick demo of um, Power Shell One Long Run with Michael and Christian. So we'll be demoing Azure Functions. Okay. So no module this time. No. No. Okay. And then a quick demo. So how long do we think? Two seconds. Okay. Cool. Awesome. And then we have Peter Fitzsimon doing a talk on PowerShell logging or building a template for PowerShell logging. It's a surprise. It's a surprise. <laughs> awesome. So we're all going to be surprised. Including it to me. Great. So I'll hand it over to Michael. He's going to do the news and he's not module of the month. <laughs> all right. Oh, yeah. I forgot the important. Could you? Oh yes, yeah, sponsors. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah. Um, oh, hang on. Aha! All right, look at that. Oh, geez, that's fantastic. Hang on, took a sec. Uh, just have to. You just can't see our awesome sponsors. So I'm just going to shrink it. And do that. The time. So, um, yeah, thanks to our sponsors. So, Hudson, thank you guys for letting us have this amazing meeting room. Um, Instinct Technology um, for providing food and obviously catering. And Iron Man Software for licenses. Um, yeah, so, on to the news. Sorry, I've just got to move this because of things. All right, we're back. We're back from our screen. Perfect. Alrighty, so um, feel free guys to jump in if I've missed anything. Um, PowerShell version 7 preview 2 is out. <coughs> um, so run it, love it, hate it. Um, feedback, lots of feedback. Um, second one which is really important um, for everyone is Meetup is back. So if you are not on Meetup, I really strongly recommend you get on Meetup because um, that's really where we're going to be doing a lot of our um, events and stuff like that. So um, I really, really, yeah, can't emphasize that enough. If you can jump back on Meetup, that would be fantastic. Um, obviously, to prevent all the shenanigans with um, um, the other random users, we've obviously got the, the, the questionnaire. Um, again, that's just to prevent bots. So that's all good. Um, potentially a new sponsor, I'm not actually... Um, that's still kind of in the works yeah. with regards to um, Adrian at Troco. Yeah. Um, so there's obviously um, potential there. Um, and ternary operators in PowerShell Core um, version 7. So that's actually a very, very interesting um, argument that um, has been going around from Bruce, which is basically do we need ternary operators? So in the sense that um, they are kind of, you know, they do, they are treated as trash. So it's kind of, it is going down that alias kind of track in terms of are we starting to become more like C-sharp and not enough like PowerShell. So um, yeah, it's very interesting, very interesting. Um, there is a, there's a vote. I don't know if the vote's closed or not. Um, but yeah, so we'll see from that. Um, Briz plug Twitch channel. So obviously, yes, Brisbane PowerShell <coughs> group has its own Twitch channel. Um, I'm gonna continue to host on my channel. So obviously um, the viewers um, can, Transition over. So basically, all you need to do is subscribe to the um, the um, Brizpug Twitch channel, um, which is just twitch.tv slash Brizpug, and um, you can subscribe to that. Um, from that, basically, all the, the meetup events and things like that will be going from there. So I'll continue to host it on my channel. So obviously, um, we can go from there. And also, I will be um, doing a pull request in the future to bring it into PowerShell Live. So. You can even go to twitch.tv PowerShell Live and then basically it'll just be there as well. So um, I just got to mark together and do a pull request on um, Mark's um, functions project. Um, so this is a little bit old, but it's still pretty good, uh, which is basically the Microsoft PowerShell module for Teams is now in GA. So if you're using Microsoft Teams um, with PowerShell, um, it's now in GA, but um, Keep in mind that um, obviously that's going to change over time. I'm not sure if um, the, the module's actually pointing to um, graphs 
um, beta URLs or whether it's version 1.0, but that's something you got. Um, that's something that's going to need to be um, for, you, um, for, the, for those guys to kind of explore. Um, yeah, so that's pretty cool. Um, I know so that. What does that allow you to do? Um, so I'm, from what I remember last time, it's basically just provisioning your teams. So you can create MS teams, remove teams, add members, delegate permissions, blah, blah, permissions, but like, you know, delegate um, or access to. Oh, right. yeah. So it doesn't allow you to just set up now. Um, I, yeah, it's more it's more for admin kind of thing. So it's a bit like yeah. Um, if if you wanted to send messages and things like that in chat, you're gonna have to use graph itself. So that's yeah. Does it let you migrate teams between tenancies? Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, module of the month. So um, unfortunately, Christian's not gonna be here, which is a bit of a, a bummer. Um, but one of the things that um, we've been working on with in on our, the PowerShell channel is. Basically, with one-on-one -on -one with Michael and Christian, was obviously teaching in PowerShell, and the project that we we're using was a remote execution bot. So, similar to, um, I'm not going to say it's exactly because it's not anywhere close at this point in time. It's literally just a, 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 a bare bones project. Um, is similar project to a uh, similar process to Azure Automation, where you can remote execute a, a PowerShell on a machine over the internet. So you can touch that machine out there. Um, so and then send it jobs and receive jobs. So. Um, oh yeah, I'm actually even mad at it. Google, I just Googled something. Anyway. Um, so basically it's just a PS bot that I thought we can just kind of um, chuck in there. And obviously, um, yeah, so what we can do is, um, it's a demo time. So this is gonna be a really quick demo. So um, it's gonna go in the machine. Uh, yeah. So we've got, um, so basically in here, I've got my C-sharp service. This is just running locally on my machine because I didn't have enough time to fix it to work on another machine uh, because there is issues with my C-sharp. Um, I just gotta find the server service. Um, it is called service one because, you know, why not? Um, so this is just basically a standard C-sharp service um, that you can register. So it's just a PS worker service. Um, I'll just start it. Manual apply. So basically, um, what we have here. Um, so this is basically my. Um, these are my Azure functions that are loaded in um, Visual Studio Code. So what I can do here is just start those functions. So it'll fire up. What does that do? So it's actually, um, it starts up a local debuggable instance of the Azure function. So you can basically, you see so you have the runtime? Uh, sorry? So you have the runtime local? Yeah. Okay. So basically you use um, the Azure functions um, VS plugin. Um, you need to install a whole bunch of different things. So you need Node.js, you need um, .NET source, uh, .NET code, core, SDKs, things like that. So you need all the C sharp things that you're gonna need to do to actually run it. So as we can see, we're actually running a whole bunch of different things because um, something <coughs> actually, no, the reason why this is happening is actually because the service is calling it. It's actually saying, hey, do you have a job for me? So um, basically, I've got a whole bunch of different functions, and this is all written in PowerShell. So um, I'll just quickly show you one of them so you can kind of get a bit of an idea. Like, obviously, when I do my talk on functions, we'll go into this a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. um, is this technically PowerShell Core? This is PowerShell Core, 100% PowerShell Core. Um, so... Um, so it's basically just blah, 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 blah. All my supporting terrible code, obviously. One really good, really, really, really big lesson that I learned is secure strings don't debug well in Azure Functions. So the way you hook a debugger into it is basically you um, put a, a wait debugger um, command into a line and it'll basically execution will go to that line and then you can actually um, hook your remote attach a debugger. <coughs> the problem with it was Basically, anything before or after a secure, or anything after a secure string, it just wouldn't wouldn't work. If you tried, even if you even if you had a wait debugger on the line before the secure string, um, it would work, and then you try and step over or run past, and it would just literally hang, and the function would crash. So it would actually made a bit of a challenge to debug that. Um, it was also a bit of a bug on the client, but um, yeah. So basically, we've obviously got an Azure Vault secret. So that basically, yeah, and that's just a secure string that comes back. So um, talk to my DBA, my SQL instance in the cloud. And that's just doing an SQL lookup. So it's really basic, really easy to use, way better than the um, earlier version. Um, it's, it was an absolute headache to get set up, but that was just due to me. So I'm not 
saying anything else because I'm not, I'm not blaming anyone because it was me. I, I screwed it up. So, um, but once it's running, it's fantastic. So now I've just got some uh, demo files here. I'm just running in a five because um, I can't be bothered trying to deal with all the other issues. And so basically all it's doing is it's just sending rest jobs back and forth. So what I can do here is we can just go start PS remote job. Um, I'm just going to go computer name and we're just going to say uh, pocket rocket because that's my machine. Um, PowerShell script and you, we're just going to put a script block in there. We're just going to go, who am I? Um, oh, I'm going to put a URI. Fantastic. Uh, helps if I actually haven't got the URIs there. Did it? Let's not test the tests. Hate it. Ah, damn it. Just need to grab this. Okay, and don't you run anything. Copy. I'm gonna be really dirty here. Let's do this. So I'm just gonna send it to a start job. So we'll just paste that URL in. Just start job with a Function. It's just an Azure function, yeah. <coughs> it's just is basically it just a, like a, a method in, like a function inside your Azure function. The the, H, the HTTP start job. Um, it's 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 its own function. It's its own function. Yeah. Okay. Now, realistically, I can make like combine them because yeah. basically you got get some like this is just the post. Yeah. Um, so I could actually like merge them, but um, yeah. So. Yeah. So I'm an Azure function, and which has the most horrible questions. <laughs> yeah. So you can see there we've got a status <coughs> queue. We've got our grid. Um, so it generates a grid and we can see a status of queue. Um, so what we can do is grab old matey here, like so. Um, invoke, oh, uh, job. Like so, chuck our grid in. Um, the grid's basically what it's using. Um, we need to grab the test job. No, the seed job. I would definitely could have named these a bit better, but it's me. You can see it actually comes back and so into this RE system. So it actually is the exec it's actually taken that, serialized it, executed it. And <coughs> so it's actually really cool. Um, you can actually run full stuff, so I'll just quickly demo that and then we'll just move on. So what we can do here is we can just basically say, okay, let's do what what should we do apart from uh, shutdown? <laughs> um, let's just do uh, get process. Oh yeah, that's a collection. Right? It's a collection. Yeah. So hit it. Oh, put the URI in. Let's just run this. But maybe this is the last one. Right? So we start our job. So again, we get a new grid. Same thing. So it's just generating a grid. That's like you know, obviously two seconds worth of work. Then we can actually receive it. It's pretty snappy. It's gonna it picks it up every five seconds. So there's a configuration on the service that'll just um, pick up this. Um, it'll trigger a timer event every five seconds to actually check for jobs. So um, it's pretty quick. So what we can do here is we can then just go like so and hit enter, and then we go we got a serialized response. So one of the things that I'm not I like at the end of the day, this can be improved. So it's just serializing it as JSON. Um, I would like to re-serialize it as Chi XML. I think that's a better way of obviously a better standard to be used. So what does get PS remote job return? What does it, what does it return? What is that? It's a bunch of strings. What is that? Uh, that's basically um. So get PS remote job is basically a um. Uh, let's quickly show you. Like what is the object that's returned there? Is that an actual? That's a PS object. Okay. Um, so the thing is that because it serializes JSON, it's lost that type information. Yeah. And to be honest, like it's better to serialize it as a Chi XML. But this is just me being me being lazy. So, okay. but it's just a really good proof. But of it's still an object. It's not just strings. No, it's it's, yeah. it's, it's an actual object yeah. that's coming back and it's yeah. yeah. So when it when the C sharp the C sharp service converts it, it'll actually convert. It'll serialize it as JSON and then send it, um, send the JSON response back. And then this will just take that JSON and then. Um, Serialize it as a PS object. Awesome. So, yeah, cool demo. Yeah. Um, many, many hours of um, work on it, but as a really cool proof of concept. So, you can, and this is really something like obviously um, it can be used for a lot of good and bad as well. So, obviously, um, you can touch any machine as long as it's got 443. 
um, same with automation. Anyway, that is that for that. Um, I'm just going to stop this so, so it doesn't. No, how do I stop it? Oh, let's put this up there. So, that's my test. And then I just shut it down and just control C it, and that's it. So, that's it for me, I think. Um, is that other one open? Oh, it is. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to share. Yeah, start this. So now um, that's pretty much that. I'm gonna let's invite uh, Peter Fitzsimon up for logging with uh, logging with PowerShell and stuff <laughs> and stuff and yeah. stuff. <laughs> thank you, Michael, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for allowing me to bore you to tears tonight. Um, when we looked at this talk, in fact, this talk came about firstly because Michael said he was desperate for someone to talk. So. Don't, don't feel as though you're going to get anything particularly classy tonight. When I gave him the, a sort of a title, he came back with a mar, far more embellished title, and I, I was a little concerned about that because that did actually sound like I knew something, and that, that, was, that was starting to look a little bit concerning to me. So well, I just have settled with just PowerShell stuff. <clears throat> a couple of disclaimers. <clears throat> I'm not any sort of PowerShell expert. Right? <clears throat> I only learn enough to do what I need to know. So I just do, what, do the stuff I need. Um, I'd love to spend a lot more time doing stuff, but I don't have the time. Acceptable, or, acceptable audience reactions from you guys are, wow, you, you are really useless, right? <laughs> you can that. Or you can say, why would you do it that way? Right. <clears throat> or you might say, haven't you heard of it? <laughs> All of those are acceptable reactions and ones I expect I'll get. Um, and I am expecting tonight that I'll get more out of tonight than you will, right? Because you'll tell me things that I should have done better. Bit of history. <clears throat> So I've worked on a number of Exchange um, 2007 and 2010 projects, you can see how old I am then, in that sort of space. PowerShell was a big thing back then, right, because the people were just getting into it, so I had to learn PowerShell. And now I do stuff with Office 365 as well, um, nowhere near as sophisticated as some people, but um, <clears throat> I have obviously carried forward that, that sort of knowledge and used it for stuff. When I was working on the projects, I needed to run a range of, of reports to man monitor the, the status of the projects, right? So <clears throat> we were migrating users between environments, so migrated user lists, we had to sort of run a report on a regular basis to find out what was happening. So I would create the reports and, and send them out to people. License allocation reports is another interesting one. Is, is in our environment, we get a lot of people complaining, oh, I don't have a license for this, or oh, my, this is not working, and you turn around, it's just licenses haven't been allocated properly, so we go look at that sort of stuff. And there's a range of other things. Um, mailbox move commands. Um, <clears throat> when you're moving, when you're moving mailboxes, you really have to um, make sure you log what, what's going on, so you know which ones failed. And and I don't think I've ever done a set of mailbox move that at least a couple haven't failed for, for some reason. <coughs> and I've also used this for just starting logging the starting and stopping of VMs, um, largely in the VMware environment when I first used it, but, it, but I could do it as well. So the result of having to do all those things was that I said, you know, I just need a little skeleton script that every time I want to do something. I'll just take that skeleton script and I'll throw the, the bits I want to do in the middle of it and come out with something that uh, makes life easy for myself rather than having to create the stuff all the time. So I'll give a quick demo of, of the script that I've got, the skeleton script, and then we'll talk about some of the reasons behind some of the stuff I've done. <coughs> so here's the script here. I call it Skel2. You can tell that's pretty good. There must, must be two versions of it. Um, <coughs> I've read it, written it at least twice. Uh, so. and, and basically, Right. It's a whole stack of stuff that I just uh, set up at the start of the script. Um, I, I, only, only in doing this presentation did I realise that, um, that in fact, uh, no, I'm on the wrong one. Oh, only in doing this during the um, presentation did I realise that there's like 90 lines of, of startup <laughs> script in there before I actually do anything useful. But um, about 30% of that is comments anyway. So right here, right in the middle of the script, I stick the, I stick the, <laughs> the code that I actually want to achieve anything with, and then I do it. And basically what it does is sets some stuff up, does some logging, and at the end of it, it'll send me the reports, it'll email me the reports and stuff that I, that I, I want to see, and it will store the logs as well, save the logs. So I'm just going to run that. Um, I can do that inside the IDE. <coughs> and what it's going to ask me for, this is, when you want to do an email, it's a bit of a pain because you've got to have an email account to do it. There are ways of automating this. I haven't done it on this one. Right. And bingo. All that's done now is it's run a code, it's written the log, it's written that bit of code in the, in the log, and basically it's sent me an email. 
and that means I can monitor this stuff. The reasons I'm doing this is that we, we needed to know sort of almost on an overnight basis um, Yeah. So there's 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 the, the email it sent me, and in the bottom of the email I attach the attach the log, so the log is there. I can go in and have a look at the log uh, remotely to do that. I'm not going to do it here because it wants to download. The other place that I stick the logs, and I'll talk about this one too, is uh, right. So I create a subdirectory. I create a directory. And all the logs go in there as well. So I can basically just keep um, having the logs. The fun bit sometimes is, is when you get a lot of logs, <laughs> you've got to delete them. So I've actually written stuff in the code that goes through and works out the old logs and gets rid of them. And that's actually saved my back, backside having um, at least 90 days of logs on one occasion because I could come in with whinging about certain VMs not stopping and starting at the right time. And I could go back through 90 days of logs and find out exactly when all the VMs started and stopped in that space. Um, I, I wish I. I wish now I had more than 90 days for that, for that stuff. So <clears throat> just going back to the presentation then. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what, what goes on, then we'll do a little another demo um, after that. So <clears throat> the principles I've just applied when I was building the scripts, obviously to make the scripts really runnable, the thing I hated the most was running a script and then having to clean up and to delete log files and doing stuff afterwards before I could rerun the script or, or do some failure. So, I make the, make the scripts basically rerunnable. We set up necessary stuff at the start and clean up at the end. And I use uniquely lame, uniquely lame log, log files so when you rerun the script, it doesn't overwrite the previous one. Now, when you're doing this in debugging, you'll run the script like you know, five times every 10 minutes or something just to keep, get things working. And you want to play that, you don't have to um, change the log files. You want to go back and around and have a look at some of the things that work. I just basically use tra transcripts. I start transcript as early as I can in the script, capture everything, and then I stop it at the end and close the log file, and then I basically um, email it to myself. Log file names and directories are based off the script name. So I pick up the name of the script, and I basically create the log file with the name of the script and the, the log directory so I know um, what I'm talking about. And obviously, that means that I can run multiple scripts with multiple names and, and not give you any clash um, in script stuff. <clears throat> a capture when the script runs, how long it took, what machine it ran on, and, and a bit about the edit history of the script. In some of the projects I worked on, we basically ran, used to run the script on, on two machines because it was a high availability environment. So we needed to make sure the script ran. We couldn't guarantee that one server actually would work or something would fail. So I would actually run it, the, the same script on both machines, but I would put a lock, a lock on one, I'd put a little locking mechanism so that when if it ran on one machine, it would check, the other machine would check if it ran and it would still not have to run. But that way also when I looked at the log, I could work out which machine it actually ran on and, and keep the um, history and that stuff. Also, um, it's kind of handy to know, I will talk about this in a minute, but handy to know what script files actually running. Because when you're running on two machines, um, then we didn't actually have an easy way of keeping the script synced <laughs> with each other. So I needed to understand that if it ran on one machine, what was the version and the date of that script that it ran so I could, I could look at, make sure I was getting some local consistency or looking at any inconsistencies. I clean up the old logs to save face simply by looking at the, the dates and times of the logs and saying anything over 90 or 120 days, I get rid of it. And I email the logs to myself for monitoring and checking. You don't have to do that with every script, but just some that you needed to know almost overnight to make sure that things happen. I used to like, like getting into work the next morning knowing that um, I had work to do to fix up someone's um, <laughs> migration that didn't work or knowing they all went fine, I didn't have to rush into work and that stuff. <coughs> so here's just a bit of code. Um, <coughs> so again, starting the script, basically you get the date to start it. I use the um, <coughs> my invocation to basically split out the the, the, um, the directory and the, and the script name. So I just save them into variables. I do um, <coughs> change the direction, the location, so that I'm in the script directory when I run. That way, when I start when I put the log files, they're gonna basically go in there. And I get the script details. So I look at, <coughs> I look at the um, the script name. I get get child, get child item for all the all the um, members of the file of the of the directory. I just choose out the ones and get the last write time and and the length of it. So I know basically that's the the status of the script when it runs. Um, <coughs> setting up the log file the directory is pretty easy. So um, you basically just um, I, I make two choices. Either I could, I could just log into the current script directory. I could put all the logs in the same directory that the script is in. Um, eventually that gets really long and ugly. Um, I find it easier for, to create a, 
a log directory, which is basically the script name dash logs. It's a subdirectory of the script directory where the script runs. I do a test for that, obviously, to make sure whether it exists or not and, and create it when it doesn't. Um, <coughs> And then I get a bit of early information. Oh, I basically create the, that's the log directory. Then the log file name is basically still based off the script name as well. So I just put that and I stick, I stick the time, the date and time on the end of it. And that way, every time it runs, I get a different, a different log file name in that space. <coughs> when I start the logging, I would, um, start, start transcript will start the logging for you. One of the things I found when I was doing long, constant testing, if the script fails, transcript doesn't turn off. <laughs> so the next time you run it, something <laughs> you actually start tra transcribing into the same log file because it's still open for the previous one. So I put like what I call a safety stop. I write the start, I stop trans transcript. It doesn't matter if it's not running already, it'll stop um, if, it, if it is. It actually gives you, this is weird, even though you choose an error action of silently continue, hoping it will just continue and not tell you anything, it actually gives you a red message every time it runs for some reason. So you, you see it, I just, I've learned to ignore it. Um, it, does, it, does, it still continues, it doesn't crash the script and stuff. So I start transcript, um, sticking out to the log file that I've got the, um, saved away. This is where I basically, um, I set a, that variable, whatever I set that to, 90 or 120 days is the number of um, log files that I keep. So then I go through that script directory and basically delete, um, using remove item, I delete anything over, um, over 90 days in that case, or 120 days or 365, whatever, whatever you need to think. Usually you're only, if you're running this on a daily basis, you're only deleting one because it's, 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 the, um, it's the last one, that, or the, not, the oldest one that you're deleting. When you're running it, sometimes you can um, delete a whole bunch of stuff. <coughs> I did find out, no, no, no. <laughs> um, the other thing I do, uh, I have a comment block here. Um, at the start of logging stuff, if I don't want to log something, if I'm running a script, I don't want to log, I just use a comment block to comment out the whole logging structure. So the script will run, I can see this stuff, I don't have to get buggerized with logs for the time being anyway, I'm getting stuff. I had some header information into the log file, so <coughs> basically just I um, put the script name in there, the machine it runs on, and that's where I store the length, the script length and the script, um, the date and time. So I've got that in the log so I know what the nature, what the, what the state of the script was when it ran, if I need to go back and check why stuff is behaving differently. And invariably in IT, stuff always behaves differently. <laughs> um, <coughs> I don't know why I did. I don't really know why I did this, but um, well, actually, I actually do know why. But I, I, I checked to see if there's any arguments past the script. I never run my scripts passing arguments. But I did actually have one occasion where I had to do something. You, know, you guys can't see that. It's just, it's just trying to look for the first character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's usually a dollar or a hash. Or a, yeah. or no, actually, two characters. Isn't it? Even two. Oh, maybe one. Yeah, just one. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> And obviously then at the end of the script, I'll do a finish message as well. So I basically um, get the date and time again. I get, work out when the, when the script runs. I like to know how long the script took. So if you were doing a, a, a migration, you might, like, would it take me an hour to migrate those users or, or three hours or whatever? Most scripts run in seconds, right? So it's, it's kind of useless for a lot of stuff. Um, <clears throat> who knows about hair strings? Oh. The name's familiar. Yeah. I forget what it is all of a sudden. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I stumbled across it and thought that's kind of weird. I must have seen it somewhere. A here string is basically a multi-line, multi-line, what would you call it, array, um, string array. Right. So you create the, you create a, a here string with um, at at um, 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 quotes and down that one, and everything in there then becomes stays in that format in the multi-line array. Oh, so, yes. So I use that for the message body when I send an email to myself. Anything I want to see in the message body, I just put it inside that, right? And I basically initially just use a um, a, a, a script a, a script message there, which is I use it as the subject and the body as well, unless I've got something specific I want to put out. But but you can adjust that as you see fit. Yeah. <coughs> um, so basically, so once I've once I've created those headers and written them out to the stuff, I can basically um, I could stop the trans transcribing here. So if I um, don't want to go any further and I don't want to send myself an email, I just um, uncomment those and, and the script will stop then. I won't be bothered with emailing stuff if I don't need it. Um, <clears throat> but if I do want to send an email, then I can continue and I do a range of things. This is entertaining. Have you guys done sending emails from PowerShell? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah? <laughs> do you find it entertaining as well? <laughs> Every time I do it, I go, oh, something works different. 
So I, I, get, I create a subject and a body of the message. Um, one of the projects I worked on, I had a choice of mail servers depending on the environment. So I would run stuff in my test environment and I would have to hit one mail server. Stuff in my production environment, I would have to sit a sec second mail server. It annoyed me that I had to keep changing the scripts between the two. So what I basically did is I built in, I did tests to say what environment I, am I in and then I would choose the mail server based on that and, and, and so stuff. So I've, that's old stuff that I did. I've now just basically created, um, I've got about four or five mail services that I could use, right? So I can use Gmail, I can use my own um, um, on Microsoft Dev account on one. I could use my work one and stuff. The stuff, guess what stuff doesn't work? <laughs> Has anyone got around that? No, I don't have to deal with it yet. No, no. So I, I don't know how you can run a script and, and hit a mail server that needs it needs an MFA for authentication to do it. Um, I think, um, I, I don't know. Like yeah, I know with Outlook you can use those keys. Yeah, you need to set up a key. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah, yeah. an app password. They have different words for it. Yeah, you can, so, Google, so you, it. you can Google it's like an app password. Yeah, yeah. 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 There's yeah. there's one for three six five. I just can't remember what it is. But you need to use it when you're using um, Outlook because yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. you go into your account, you log into your account, and then you generate <coughs> generate the app, yeah, app, app password. password that you can then use. Within they the actually account. stopped working for us for a, a reason. I don't know why. I've never tried to use them as code, but they stopped working. I've heard that. Yeah. Um, no. So, oh, yeah. Sorry. So they're being deprecated. By the yeah. No. No. I think more modern applications won't let you use them. Right. So we used to use them. You could use them for Outlook. Gmail's like done the same thing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Where where you have to. They've changed their default policy, so you can't use them without the explicit key either. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. it might be to do with the uh, yeah. anyway. the or something. <coughs> so, so the way I, the way I get around it, I just have an SMT, I just have a, a, a Gmail account that I use for nothing else, <laughs> and I just no, no mail goes. I never monitor the mail. All I use is it to authenticate and send um, send email message to myself if I need to. Mm. Um, <coughs> this is another interesting bit of code that I picked up on somewhere on a web somewhere site somewhere. You can test whether you can access the mail server. So once again, when I was working in two environments, um, I needed to know that I could actually get to the mail server I wanted to send it to. And so if you basically just do, um, hit that new object, uh, NetSockets TCP our client, it'll return whether you can actually, um, whether you can actually hit that mail server. And basically <clears throat> what I used to create was a, a server list. So I would put all the mail servers that I had access to in the environment in that list. And I didn't care what order they were in, or so. I just put them in that list and I would just scroll through and find the first one that, that would take my, <laughs> accept my connection. As soon as I found one that accept my connection, I was good, so I would, I would use that. So <clears throat> basically you can do that with stuff. I don't really need to do that um, in, the, in this script. If you, if you, you set, the, set to use a particular mail service like Gmail, you don't need to do that. But I don't want to lose that code because it's kind of handy. Um, <clears throat> so in sending stuff, you, you do have to get creds, unfortunately, for the, um, for the mail service you're talking to. You can. There is ways of, of, of building that into the code, but of course that's sort of bad security practice to build some of that stuff in there unless you know what you're doing. Um, splatting, who knows about splatting? Yeah, that's really good. <laughs> I only just found out about it like three months ago. Because yeah. <laughs> I, I did some really cryptic shit to get this working before, <laughs> before I found out about splatting. Everything's great in the world. Yeah, yeah. So I've now changed this to use a splat hash table so to basically good. set up all the parameters. Attachments are the one thing that we can't, I can't use through splatting because attachments are there or aren't, there's, there's an issue if they're not. Um, um, I see, you're saying if they're attachment, so yeah. if there's no attachment. If there's no attachment, yeah, um, it'll, it'll, it behaves differently if there is attachments and I couldn't get the splatting to work. So what, what you can do there is it's a hash table. <coughs> so what you can do is you can test on whether there's an attachment and then um, the hash table then you can add, add function. You can add to the hash table. Yeah. Just add to the hash yeah. table. Yeah, no, that, that's that is one way. I, I got I got lazy and did it slightly differently, but uh, you can do. It. Yeah. But the, so yep. you have to create the attachment here. Um, I just make sure the variable set to null, and then I um, add I add the log file basically, which is the um, if I don't want to send the log file, I just comment out that um, that uh, file uh, works. And finally, just send the email. So sending the email, basically, um, I write a last message just to say, say what I'm sending it as. I stop the, tra the transcript as, as almost the last thing I do, so I'm capturing as much, as much of the work as I can in that space, and then I use send mail message to basically send it. And instead of adding, adding it to the splat list, I basically just add attachments on the end there. 
This was the other tricky thing. That's not a default parameter, but if you don't put it on there, mm. you're not talking your mail server will fail. Because yeah. <laughs> they all want uh, SSL, SSL. tied to it. Um, put this stuff up. The old way I used to do it, I've got this, <coughs> but the old way before splatting, is I used to build out a message string with all the, with all the parameters in it, right? And then I would um, do invoke expression at the end of it when I got the, <laughs> when I got the thing I wanted. That was the only way I could get the very real variability that I wanted. But now it's a lot easier than that. <coughs> so that's basically <coughs> what I said. So doing something a bit more than just sending out the, uh, a, a write statement, um, let's have a look at how we can do that. <coughs> Peter, when you get a chance, I'm keen to see what the output of start transcript looks like in the log file. Yes, yes. Right. Yeah, in fact, I'm not well, sure if I'm jumping ahead. But no, no, no. In fact, I'm right here now. So let's have a look at one of these. <coughs> Is that the one I just ran? That one there. Yeah, so, so that's what it looks like. So it tells me this is all put in by that. That didn't used to. It didn't used to get all that stuff. You should only get about half of that now. Now, um, whatever PowerShell itself is putting all that extra stuff in there. So the stuff in there, like um, username and machine name, now I probably didn't need to, to, to be writing a machine name out anymore. But it didn't used to be in there. Oh right, so that, that just happens as soon as the transcript yeah. starts. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's yep. that, that's okay. a transcript header that PowerShell gives you. No, 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 nothing you have to do. Handy. Yeah. <clears throat> this is where my stuff starts, right? So um, I, I, that, that's a system generated message. It tells I, I log out how many old files, log files I want to get rid of. I'm just saying there, like, I didn't have to delete any. Um, script is executing, blah blah blah. There was no arguments passed. That's fine. Um, skeleton scripts testing is that right statement that I sent out, and at the end of it. Um, <clears throat> I just classify where it runs, and I, it says taking like point half a second to run. Is it half a second? Yeah, yeah, half a second to run. So I just write that out. I also say what mail server I, got, I connected to, so just so I can see that if I've got to go back for any diagnostics, um, and they send it out, and, and that's. And so those messages are going to be on a write host. Is that what you? Yes. Is that what they are? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And formatting in transcript. So I started this, this was like PowerShell 1, PowerShell 2 type stuff, and it was mm -hmm. quite different then. In fact, Power, Transcript didn't actually work in um, IDE either in those days. It's only since PowerShell 5, I believe, that I started working inside IDE. But the problem with a lot of this stuff in the early days is there was no, there was no um, line returns in it, or carriage returns in it. Mm -hmm. So this stuff would just bank all up. Oh, stuff that, so yeah. I, you see some of my code, I'll put in the right host just to put a, lot, a carriage return uh, yeah. right in the code, yeah. so it would show up in the thing and, as, as I think more, more easily yeah. 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 But um, <laughs> it seems to be getting better now in that space. All righty, so the one I wanted to show you is, I did something else tricky too, which I, I could tell you about, but I'll have to kill you. Um, <laughs> no. Um, I, put, I keep all my stuff on OneDrive for business at work, so I do stuff at work. I run off four different machines. Right? So I've got this laptop, I've got my machine at home, I've got two machines at work that I can use stuff at. And I thought, well, the only place I can put all my code that I don't have to keep copying code around is somewhere like OneDrive for business. I could do it for OneDrive personal, but there's sort of frowned upon at work doing too much in that space. So I put everything in OneDrive for business, and then I just migrate, I just can see everything um, from each machine in that space. It gets a little tricky to do some things. <coughs> so under, under Office 365, um, this is some of the stuff I do, right? So I get um, member lists and, and um, licensed user lists. So I, I created a, so that I could connect to Office 365, connect to Office 365 using the, the, the multi-factor authentication module, right? So is that, do people use that multi-factor authentication module for Office 365? No? I don't use Office 365. <coughs> no. oh, um, when we connect to 365, generally, <coughs> yeah, we, are we talking to the remote PS session? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, if you if, if you have multi-factor authentication on your account, mm. then it will um, it, it'll fail with normal stuff. You've got to go to run a special module. Um, you have to download it and have a special module to run that. And, and it's a pain in the ass to, to do it. So um, I just created a. a this is a, a, um, a Windows script basically um, that runs, and it basically loads. This is a script you can download off, off um, a, a, a GitHub, which basically contain, contains all the stuff you need to download the module and stuff out. It comes out, puts a bit of crap at the end there. <coughs> and because I 
deal with three different um, <laughs> Office 365 environments. So I've got my QGCI one that I, that I work on. I've got, I've got read, only, read only admin privileges into that so I can go in there and, and, and play around with some stuff just to get run reports and stuff like that. We've got a test, a test um, tenancy as well. So I don't have permissions in the, in the production tenancy to do some testing. So I go into test tenancy and, and test the release. And then I've got my own um, personal one there as well. So I'm going to just choose that, that one. It's going to come up and ask me for my credentials. Um, now, the good thing is this is not multi-factor, right? So um, the other two are multi-factor. This one, I haven't turned on multi-factor on this stuff. So I'm guessing what um, that module is doing is it's basically um, saving your token information locally, and then that basically is what's used yeah. by the 365 module to actually authenticate as. Yeah, so like the data is just a remote PS session with 365, so. I've, I've never drilled into it to that level. Microsoft said just use it, so I did. <laughs> you ready? So this is setting up a remote session now, so it's pulling a whole heap of crap down. How do you find the um, tension? Is it very S4 feature? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. Really good. S4 feature. Yeah. 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 The only thing yeah. is, it's only limited like five users. Sorry? It's yeah. only limited five to users. five users. Yeah. Yeah. Five or 25. And what can you do at the end of 12 months? Delete you, it. You, you can, <laughs> actually, I think you can convert it into a paid tenancy. Okay. Um, or you delete it and just create another one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. okay, cool. I'm just like, it's like, I got an email the other yeah. week. It's yeah. like, oh, your tenant's about to expire. I'm like, and what do you use like yeah. an alias, to, like an email alias, just to make, just to make a new one or something? Yeah. yeah, that's just annoying. Like, why do they have a twelve month limit on it? Yeah, it's because well, basically, like, let's say I'm I'm super dodgy, Michael, and I actually want to create a three six five mailbox. Or but just trash, they should just trash the data. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. You know, every six months or three yeah. months or something. Yeah, yeah, you know exactly. I mean? yeah. yeah. I think I think there is wise people that people get like out there. Yeah, I know. Deployment yeah. tool, laptop. Like, people start using it for production and things yeah. like that. Yeah. But I've got a um, like I've got a service now, Jeff instance, and if I leave it for like a, a brief period of time, it will yeah. just trash itself. Yeah. Wipe my data. Yeah. Which is super handy. Like, <laughs> I, I can keep my dev instance forever then. Yeah. I'm right. going to get a new one. <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, right, so, so, so I'm logged in yeah. now to Office 365, the dev tenancy, so I can just start running. This is actually PowerShell, even though the color goes all, all funny, interesting enough, because it, it's inherited from command prompt. Um, <coughs> get mailbox will just tell me the users that are in there, and there's only two: there's the discovery mailbox and and and, and my account that's in there. So now I can run now I can run a, any scripts right that I want to run, and the script I'm going to run um, is this one here: this license users. If I want to find out what um, license users I've got in there, and this is basically I've just used that same skeleton that I've got, and I've just topped and tailed um, what I want to do using the skeleton stuff. What I'm actually doing here is testing for a whole range of, of licenses that a user might have, like EMS, Enterprise Pack, Visio, Pro, stuff like that. So I can't run it inside the IDE, though. The, at last I tried, the MFA module won't run inside the IDE. So you've actually got to run it through a command prompt, a proper command prompt, PowerShell, PowerShell console. Sorry. Um, so I'm going to go over here and just run that command. And so, so there's the transcript error because I've stopped the transcript, <laughs> but it wasn't running anyway. But it doesn't it doesn't break anything. It just keeps going. Yeah, it, when it when it throws that, it's just throwing a like a non-terminating error. So it's just yeah, yeah. I wish I could get tap. I wish I could get rid of it all together, but I don't know how. You can't. You, um, <coughs> if it's it's not silent with the human one. Yeah, it's silent. Yeah, exactly. It's broken. It's, it's yeah, it's stop <laughs> transcript. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I think I think it's or yeah or something inside stop transcript <coughs> is over like overriding that. Yeah. But at the end of the day, as long as it's not terminating, that's the yeah. main thing. Yeah. So it asked me to log in again for the tenancy. I'm not really sure why it does it. I, I probably could pass the credentials that are already in there. You could try stick it inside a try catch. Oh, that'd be interesting to see if that actually. Oh yeah, could try that. I could try that. Um, throw a terminating error. So now it's run. The scripts. The scripts run, and now wants to email my stuff again. I can. Uh, <coughs>
Boom. All right. So now it's it's gone. Sent me an email, and this time um, I've actually set it up so that it it does two things. The the, the script list creates creates a uh, CSV file of, of the information about the users, and, and I create a log file. And I can email myself both of those as attachments if I want to. So in this case, I've, I've done that. Um, Right, so there's a, there's a new email. It's coming. It tells me what script to run. I click on that. Um, you'll see now I've got two two attachments. I've got the license user report, the CSV file, and I've got the um, the log file. But I've also got those. They are also then stored um, where I created the script. So over here script has run out of this directory so there's the script name dash logs with the log file and here's all the stuff I just ran so there's CSV files over there so which is the let's go let's go this way all right so there's the latest log and just for your benefit Wayne um, that's what the log file looks like again that's pretty common so do you only get write hosts in there or I'm sorry do you only get write hosts in, in the log when you when you run a write host um, command no, no, no. You get the, no, you get the output of any commands as well. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. So the, the one thing you don't get, and perhaps someone else knows the answer to this, one thing you don't get is you actually don't get the command itself that you ran. Yeah. So you don't know what command actually created those. Yeah. Right. You only know that that's the output of the command. So, yeah. Uh, it'd be nice if you could. Um, you yeah, know, I suppose if you tell, tell us yeah. put, put, add, add the name of the command and the output of it as well. Yeah. Um, I've never achieved that. But, but, um, getting around that and the other interesting thing though which is annoying is sometimes the stuff in here doesn't come out in exact order so oh that's weird well, sync or something. yeah no, it's just a little bit out of sync sometimes so you get you get you get i've had situations where you get output well that could be something else and then some other output so you're actually getting the output of two commands mixed up a little bit mm. and, and the first time you see it you go that's really weird but it, it happens every time so once you realize what's going on it's consistent. Uh, according to Microsoft, it will output all, all output that appears on the console. Right. Okay. In theory, other other com other commands like write output or yeah yeah write yeah host yeah. yeah. Would, in theory, go up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've I've never used anything except write host, but I'm, I'm sure yeah. there's And this is the CSV file that I've just created in the script. <coughs> and of course, there's only only one user in it, so. It's only <laughs> Write information. Write information. Yeah. It writes through the information stream. That yeah. seems like a cool thing. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. But it was like, <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so. I need that in my life. <laughs> this report just shows me what users got. I've only got one user. It's only got one license in, in there. But in, in some environments, we have users with, you know, if you had five licenses, you'd have an enterprise pack, an EMS, maybe a Visio client, they would all show up in that space. Um, some of them, sometimes you get multiple, you can have you know, dozens of licenses. If I don't recognize them um, in licenses, I just stick them at five and six and seven and eight if I, if I need to. Yeah. But that's, re that's really handy when someone comes and says, my Visio is not working. And you go in and run a report and you go, that's because someone took away your Visio <laughs> license. That doesn't happen very often except. How about around the throat? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. In, in fact, in fact, that was one of the things when we might did a, a major migration on on prem. After that, we had to do some uh, do some stuff yes. on that. All right, <laughs> so geez, we don't give you one. <laughs> yeah, thanks. All right, that's about that's as hard as it gets, guys. As I said that's the usage um, Office three six five. I use it now um, for getting licensing reports and stuff. Um, you can run it as, as starter tasks. It's kind of good to do stuff. The trouble is, you got to make sure you, you um, where you put your credentials so it actually runs as a starter task. In VM, in the VMware world, we used to do it. Um, we would create a, a, a service account that really had no permissions other than start and stop of VM. So if someone, someone, and it was really locked, it was locked away somewhere high, and so people couldn't really see it. But if anyone knew those credentials for that service account, the only thing they could do was start and stop VM. They couldn't do anything else. Um, that's it, guys. So yeah, oh, questions, suggestions. Because that's transcript. I'm just reading all the little guys because I've actually never, I've never used it. I've heard it's there, but never used it. Every, yeah, yeah, every time, every time that like we've had like I've worked with Microsoft, the first thing they do is start transcript. Yeah. I was like, 
Do I need to do this? Do I need to start transcript all my actions? It, it seems to handle, I'm reading about it, it seems to handle the whole file operation quite well. Mm. So there's like no callback switch, so it will fail, it won't overwrite files you don't want to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It'll add some extra random characters in the end, so you, you know, optionally. Yeah. Always, so you can't, if you just run it for two times, it, you'll never overwrite the same file. That's yeah, no, it's just that's not fair. And it must be doing some async write. Like in order to not not bog the script down, <coughs> yeah. probably like sometimes they're out of order. Out of order. Yeah, yeah. Because you chew them up somehow and then and then flush them down and get it. Yeah, I've, I've never really used them that much in interactive sessions. I have done it, mm. started and stopped it, and done that stuff mm. as testing. But um, I largely just use it for like script behaviors, so I can capture. Yeah. Things I also there. believe that you can actually turn transcripting on in group policy. Yes, you can. Yes, I, I read that today actually. Yeah. And, and the thing I couldn't understand fully with that is how you would control where the logs went yeah yeah right? i think so you also got the issue with bloating as well yeah because yeah so um, it's good good to keep an eye on some other admins if you need to actually yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly this guy's out of control yeah. <laughs> all right that's it i'm done guys great yeah. thank you thank you <laughs> Going on away. You're in charge, yeah. I think, I think um, staff's transcript is a really good, um, like, it's always something that, like, I've always thought about, and I've gone, oh, you know. I just want to get rid of that red on your error there. I can't change the display. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you can, if you can get rid of that, the red on your very close. I'm glad like to live with it, yeah. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks Victor from Hudson for taking care of us tonight and Pablo's absence. Really appreciate that. Um, we'll be back again next month with a new talk. We haven't decided what it'll be yet. We haven't got a speaker or do we have a speaker? I haven't a speaker. Yeah, haven't a speaker yet. It's, it's either so, going to be Alex with Plaster. Oh yeah, good. Um, I've been looking forward to that. Yeah, me too actually. Yeah. Um, or it'll be me with um, functions. Yeah. So. Awesome. And yeah. I'm, I'm also um, uh, working with um, yeah, some sponsors and we may have some sponsored talk, talks coming up as well, but we're trying to keep it super interesting and PowerShell focused. So there may be some of those as well. Yep. Awesome. Done. All right. Thank you. Thanks, guys. See you, guys. Turn that off, please. <laughs>